say what and to hear and enjoy the singing together um, of my church family. This is our church that we enjoy being with. And uh, although it was nice to go and visit other churches, I, I preached in South Africa and then preached in Tanzania at their churches. It's such a joy to come back to your church family and to sing together and worship together. I will say one thing. Um, last Sunday morning after speaking at the... Uh, uh, at the church in Tanzania, they had Connie and I come forward, and um, they had then a few people come dancing and singing forward, and they put Mas uh, Maasai uh, tribe wraps on us, and we are now, which the Maasai are warrior tribe, so we are now Maasai warriors. And so um, that doesn't mean I know how to throw a spear because uh, they hunt with spears, but I'm a Maasai warrior. I, I should have brought my wrap in this morning to show you. I'll bring it tonight and show you, uh, but that was pretty neat. Well, we're going to start a new series this morning, the book of James. So I to invite you to turn there. And uh, because of timing of doing the updates and those things this morning, we're not going to cover all of your notes that you have in the bulletin. We're going to get to the first point and kind of hit the introduction, whet your appetite for the book of James, and then we're going to enjoy some time of communion together around the Lord's table. And, but I'm really excited to start this new series. It's a wonderful book. Um, it's going to mesh and harmonize really well with what we've been studying and, and as a church and what we are studying. Um, and I say that because of many reasons. Um, you remember we just finished studying through the, the book or the study of the Sermon on the Mount. And James is, of all the New Testament writers, he references and looks back to and goes back to the Sermon on the Mount more than any other New Testament book. In fact, over 20 times, uh, some say as much as 24 to 25 times, James references and goes back to and looks at uh, sections and portions of the Sermon on the Mount. So this is going to be a great follow-up into that. Uh, also, uh, we began last Wednesday in our uh, small groups a study through the book of Proverbs. Uh, and what's interesting is James is known as the Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, he gives so many books or, or uh, insights into wisdom into that uh, throughout this little book. In fact, John Calvin called it the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so I think that's going to tie in very well with what we're doing on Wednesday nights. In addition to that, we did a little break between the Sermon on the Mount and this. Look at the balanced life, the balanced Christian life. And in uh, a numerous amount of passages in the book of James... He looks at contrasts and balancing the contrast of, of aspects of the Christian walk. Um, and, and so he's, he's gonna, this is going to tie in so well and mesh and harmonize with where we've been. And, and James is going to go beyond the profession of faith. He's going to go beyond uh, just saying we know Christ to, to do we walk in that? Do we live in that? He, he, he gives uh, uh, many, many imperatives. In fact, of the 108 verses in the book, 54 of them contain imperative statements, imperative verbs. So one out of every two verses in the book of James are giving commands. So James is kind of like that, that crusty drill sergeant saying, this is what you have to do. This is what Christianity looks like. Take these words of wisdom, take what Christ has put in you, and, and, and make it more than just talk, make it your walk. Talk, talk is cheap, but James wants to see results. And so I, I find that interesting as well as he, as he details that in these contrasts that consistently he looks at this um, uh, this issue of don't be double-minded. In fact, we find that statement twice in the book of James, and it's nowhere else found in the rest of the New Testament. Uh, the warning against double-mindedness, the warning against being uh, staring and looking at both directions and just trying to determine, am I going to live for the world? Am I going to for, live for myself and my flesh? Or am I going to really live for God? To not just put on the face and come on Sunday morning, put on the mask and say, yeah, I'm going to be all happy and I'm going to sing and do those things on Sunday. But then the rest of the week I go out and do my own thing and I live for me and I live for this world. And he says, no, we can't do that. Don't be double-minded. You must make a decision. Am I going to live for Christ and walk with Christ? He looks at that in a variety of times. He balances the two opposites of our daily living. He talks about in chapter 1 and verse 2, the, the balance uh, or the, the contrast of joy in service or misery in trials. 
Later on in verse 22, to, to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Later on in chapter 2 and verse 8, he, he contrasts loving your neighbor versus showing partiality or favoritism. The, the don't just show specialness to, to those who are, are wealthy or of, of, of good means, but to love your neighbor genuinely. In chapter 2, verse 14, he contrasts internal faith versus external works. Chapter 3 and verse 9, he deals with the balance of verbal blessings versus vocal cursings. How is my tongue going to be used? Uh, our tongue should not, out of the same well, should, should not spring forth both blessings and cursings. We shouldn't be able to praise God on Sunday and talk about, oh, what a blessing it is and how great God is, and at the same time go out and our tongue be used to, to speak for things that are profane and are anti um, blessings of the Lord. Chapter 3 and verse 15 to 18, he contrasts godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Chapter 4 and verse 6, proud living versus humility. And so what a practical book that this is that we're going to begin a study on. And so here we go, walking out our Christian life, and James is clear that this is, this is a struggle. And walking the walk is, is a challenge. But he also consistently reminds us that we can't walk this alone. He brings us back to the fact that we're not alone. As Christ is there to help and strengthen us. A few weeks ago, I, I shared a story of the, the flying Walendas. They were the, uh, the, the tightrope walking family, the Walenda family for generations, uh, known for their, their tightrope walking uh, circus performing family. And uh, many years ago, the Walendas were performing with the Ringling Brothers Circus and were quite a draw where they performed. And, and one of the cities where they were coming to um, a, a local weather reporter uh, came to the patriarch uh, of the, the Willenda family, Carl Willenda, and said, hey, I, I'd really like to see if it'd be possible if I could step out on the wire, just, just step out on it and, and give my weather report from the wire. Can, can you give me some instructions? Would I be able to do that? And Carl said, sure. So he, you know, go, goes through some instructions with them and the guy's kind of like, yeah, 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 you know, just taking in, not really listening. Because uh, he's just focused on, I want to give this weather report. So the time comes, the big moment comes, and the man steps out, one step out onto the wire. And he gives the reporter, he gives a quick, tomorrow the weather will be overcast, high of 82 degrees, a low of 73. And that's it. Immediately the, the, the cameras go off, and uh, he's done. And he's, he's thinking, great, I did this, this was pretty cool. And he asked Mr. Walenda, he says, Mr. Walenda, how do I get back? Do I take my right foot back or my left foot back? In his haste to make the high viewer ratings rather than be safe, the reporter didn't really listen to all of the, the, uh, uh, the instructions from Carl Walenda, and he didn't realize the predicament he was in. And Carl Walenda said, son, step forward. I'll be right behind you. We'll make it to the other side. And the nervous reporter said, uh, Mr. Walenda, I, I can't do that. I've, I've never walked a tightrope before. I can't go across this thing. And again, he replied, son, I've walked the tightrope all my life, and you don't want to step back. You've got 33 steps in front of you. Believe me, it's safer to take 33 steps forward than one step back. But don't be afraid. I'll be right behind you. Boy, I think that's exactly what James is going to focus on in this. You stepped out in your Christian life. You stepped out into the tightrope. And you probably didn't realize, or maybe you didn't realize, how difficult it was going to be sometimes. But now you're out there. And you realize, man, there are different winds and challenges that come at me at different times. And there's struggles to, am I going to, am I going to fudge in my faith in this? Am I going to uh, let my character go in this? Or am I going to take in the world or live for the world? Or am I going to go forward with this? And we're almost let to say, how do I get back off of this thing? And Jesus Christ comes in beside and says, son, listen. I'm right behind you. You need to go forward. Don't quit. You can't step back. Go forward. 33 steps ahead. But I'm going to be right there with you. So don't be afraid. That's what the book of James is about. That's what the book of James is about, is taking the wisdom that God has for us, taking the encouragement and saying, let's walk through the Christian life different. Let's make it real in our lives. Go forward and not back. And so that's where we're going to go. And one more thing before we begin this study. Hopefully, now you're beginning to see the overwhelming value of the book of James. 
there's not probably a more practical book in the New Testament. Uh, probably a more life-transforming book than this little epistle. The value, the wisdom here. It's only three pages in my Bible. I don't know how many it is in yours. But it can change your life. And so I want to make another little proposition, a little challenge to you. To meditate on it in a special way. And I want to challenge you to memorize with me the entire epistle. Now some of you say, well, that's five chapters. I know. But you can do it. Three pages. You can do it. And I want to give you some encouragement in this. I'm going to give you some tips real quick here to memorize it. Because this wisdom is we need to hide God's word in our heart. To meditate on it. The book of Joshua, when God calls out Joshua, he says, I want you to take my word and hide it in your heart to meditate on it. I want to encourage you to meditate on God's word in James. Just start working your way through, and you'll begin to see it flow. So let me give you some tips, and, and, and what I'd like for you to do is, is if and when you memorize it, come share it with myself or Pastor Aaron. And then we'd like to have a special dinner. We'll go out together and um, all of us who ever memorize it, um, and uh, just rejoice in what God has done in our lives. And so I want to challenge you to do this. Um, I know some of you are saying, yeah, but I've not got that young mind like I used to. I can memorize. Those are one of kids. Man, they just spit them off. Yeah, but they work at it. And if you work at it, I promise you, you can memorize the Word of God. He didn't tell us to meditate on it and memorize God's Word if he didn't think we could do it. So let me just give you a couple quick tips that will help you with it. That it helped me as I memorized. First of all, break into segments of thought. Um, understand where it's going. You need to understand what you read and memorize, memorize if it's going to sink in. And so break into segments. What is James talking about here? He gives the introduction in verse 1. Verses 2 through 4, he's talking about the trials and, and the difficulties of the trials. He's going to talk about if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that, that gives it freely. So break into segments that you can memorize in, in portions there. Secondly, then, write down portions on maybe a small card uh, or whatever it might be and, um, and keep that with you. Uh, that's what I've done many times has helped me in my, in my walk of memorizing Scripture. And, is I'll write them out and then I'll have them in my pockets and I can pull that out. Uh, you might be sitting in traffic, you might be sitting uh, at the grocery store waiting in line, and you can pull that out and just look over your card one more time. And just even writing it down helps um, and, and memorizing scripture. And so write that out. Some, of, some people like to write it out multiple times. And you'll be surprised how quickly you can memorize it that way. Uh, thirdly, place portions that you're memorizing in key places. Places that you're going to see regularly. Um, yes, you can put some in your pocket. But um, your mirror in the morning. Uh, we've got right now James chapter 1 and James chapter 2 taped inside our, our shower. And uh, we're working on it in there. Um, maybe for you it's in your dashboard of your car. Stick a couple verses there. And, um, and, and put them places you're going to see. That will remind you to keep looking it over. And you need to put it before you. Fourthly is be diligent. Memorizing and meditating on God's word takes effort. Uh, God promised Joshua that if he would meditate on it, he would be prosperous and have good success. He'd be, have prudence and wisdom. And then review. Fifthly, review previous portions memorized to keep them afresh. So after you finish chapter 1, work through it again. And then start chapter 2 and just re repeatedly go back and review those things. And then the last point is apply it to your life. Apply it. How does this fit in my life? And if you work on those things and you work through it, you can memorize. So I want to challenge. Let's, let's do that together. Let's memorize the book of James. And let's see what God does as we hide his word in his heart. So we said all that so far as way of introduction. And to see how practical this is going to be, let's have a quick word of prayer. And then what I want to do is I want to lay the groundwork just briefly out of verse 1. That's all we're going to get to this morning is verse 1 uh, because of time. And we'll come back to the rest later on and just kind of see the groundwork. So let's have a word of prayer together. Father, I want to thank you so much for uh, your word, for the opportunity to study the book of James. Uh, that you have given to us that we might learn how to walk through the Christian life. But thank you that we're not alone in this. Uh, that that you're there with us to help us, to strengthen us, that, uh, that we can come boldly into your throne, that we might obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Lord, I pray you'd help this study be practical for this church, for my life, for us together as we work through this. Thank you for this church body. God, I'm so, uh, so 
uh, privilege to be the pastor here and to be a part of this church family. I thank you for the love and the communion that's here and it's uh, a joy to come back after being away for several weeks. But God, I pray you continue growing in us and help us to become more like Christ. Help us be effective in our witness outside of here and, and living for you in this culture and in this world. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's just deal with then our first point, the greetings, in verse 1. Uh, and James doesn't waste much time here. He says, James, a bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's really our introduction. That's it. Uh, before he jumps in the very first topic. Um, but let's look at that to get a frame of reference as we study this. So let's um, see this. So he starts with saying, James, a bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that then begs the question to us, well, who is this James? Why should I listen to him? Why does he have any credibility in giving me words of wisdom? Well, obviously, um, we listen to it because it's the inspired word of God. God used him to breathe out its scripture. It's, it's God's word to us. Second uh, Peter tells us that. Uh, but why does he have, who is this guy James to even be used of God to write Proverbs wisdom to us. I mean, we know Solomon in the Old Testament, the, uh, the son of David, he was granted wisdom by God. Uh, he asked for that. God said, what do you want? He said, I want wisdom. And God said, I'll give you wisdom. I'm also going to give you the things that I thought you would ask or that would be normal for people to ask. And so Solomon's granted wisdom that we have the book of Proverbs. But what about this guy, James? Who is he? Why should we listen to him? Well, actually, there's four James in the New Testament, four different James. Let me just give them to you, and then I'll tell you which one uh, is the one I believe is the, uh, the author here. There's, first of all, there's James, the son of Zebedee. He's one of the apostles. He's the brother of John, and uh, this is not him. Uh, James, the son of Zebedee, was martyred by Herod in A.D. 44, long before this book was written. Even though James is one of the earliest books of the New Testament, uh, he was still gone, as recorded in Acts 12, and so it would be too early for him. So James, the son of Zebedee, is not the author of this book. There's also another James in the Apostles. That's James, the son of Alphaeus, sometimes known as James the Less. Um, very little is known of him. We don't find in the New Testament much being said about James the Less. Uh, it seems very unlikely that this is written by James the Less, uh, that he's this influential writer. There's also a, a lesser known one in the book or the New Testament called, uh, his name of James. He's the father of Judas. Um, and clearly, this is not him. But then there's one more James, and this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. We know half-brother because although he uh, had the same mother, Jesus was uh, not of flesh of, of uh, Joseph. And so, they would have been half-brothers. Um, and we know that they, he had several half-brothers. And according to tradition uh, and the New Testament content, it would, I, would, I would contest that this is the writer of James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, that's very interesting to us as we come to this. Uh, we know that Jesus had brothers and sisters. They were even named in Matthew chapter 13, and verse 55, and one of them is James in there. Uh, but interestingly, John tells us in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, that during Jesus' earthly ministry, his brothers did not believe on him. Now, they didn't follow Christ. And, and, and yet, by the time we come uh, a little later on to Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, after Jesus ascends and the, uh, and the apostles go back to the upper room to pray, we find there that, that Mary and Jesus' brother, including James, is there amongst that group praying and, and is waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so somewhere between John 7, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, and the ascension of Jesus something happened to change James. Well, what was that? What changed James that he would be open to, now I'm going to follow Christ, that he's actually the one, he wasn't just, you know, my brother, that, that we would wrestle and different things, that he's actually the son of God. Well, I'll tell you what changed him. According to uh, 1 Corinthians, we find out in chapter 15 that Jesus came during his, uh, that, that period between his resurrection and his ascension, and he appeared to James. He spent time with James. He comes back to him and says, Hey, brother, you remember me? Yeah, you remember I was the one that died on the cross a little bit ago? Here I am. You know, wouldn't that change your life? 
uh, you know, to see your brother that had died and now is standing before you? It changed him, and he knew that this is not just an earthly brother. This was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ, and it changed him. And he lived a completely different life from that point forward. In fact, by Galatians 1.19, um, Paul calls him, James the brother of Jesus and says that he is a pillar of the church. He is a critical person in the church. And according to historian Josephus, tradition tells that he was martyred for his faith uh, in Christ by the Pharisees in A.D. 62. They, the Pharisees took him and cast him out of the temple and beat him with clubs. And he was witnessed as here, they, they said that, that he as in his own, as he was dying there being brutally massacred, uh, he was heard to be said the same thing that Jesus said, uh, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As a godly man who was changed by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is changed by the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he rose again, according to the scriptures, that changed him. So this is a pretty credible guy. Um, and, but notice how he labels himself here. James, what? A bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, James could have easily pulled rank, couldn't he? I'm going to write a book and you're going to listen to me. I'm James, the brother of Jesus. And I'm going to write a book and you're listening to me. No, it doesn't say that. He could have said, James, the, the leader of the church of Jerusalem. It doesn't say that. He says, James, the bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just a servant. I'm a servant of God. The, uh, the, the word there, bond servant, was, was a term that, that spoke of uh, a slave. It refers to those who are property of their masters. They have no rights. And he says, I have no rights. I'm a slave of God. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. My life isn't my life anymore. My life is his. So you want to know who I am? I'm a slave. You want to know who I am? My identity isn't, isn't in, isn't in my, my, my family upbringing. My identity isn't what I do and who I am in this community and in the church. My identity is that I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What's your identity? What's your identity? Is your identity that we are slaves of Christ? I have no better position than to follow him. He's my master. He's my Lord. And I'm going to follow him. I'm going to walk through this Christian life. What a humility that he possesses here. How important that is. Parents, young people, elderly in the church. What wisdom that comes from the humility here. There's a great credibility from this guy. Uh, that he is a humble man, a servant of God, a bond servant of God. Not only this, he is also, tradition calls him old camel knees. Not because he's got like some weird formation, but because he's a guy that spent so much time on his knees in prayer. Walked with God in prayer that his knees, they say, were calloused like a camel's. This guy is credible. And so when we come to the book of James, this isn't just some obscure guy that's writing us. This is a guy who walked with Christ. Who, who, who it was changed by Christ. And so when he speaks of wisdom and he speaks about how, what it looks like to live and walk with Christ, he speaks authoritatively. And so the last piece of the puzzle then is the readership. Who, who's he writing to? To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. The 12 tribes obviously speaks of the Jews. And it's the Jews who are scattered abroad. They are... Um, uh, they are those who uh, have been spread out because of the persecution. And the word there to be scattered abroad means to be spread out in order to be planted somewhere. God, God spread out the church on purpose. So they could be planted over here and planted over there. So the church would expand out. The gospel would be spread out. And so God even used persecution so that others might go out. And he says, I'm going to speak to those. I want to speak to those who are, are, are living for Christ and they're paying the price. That, that are counting the cost, and it's, it is a costly thing to live for Christ. To go out in their community, to go out in their workplace, and, it, and it's something that's not easy. It's not, it's not just a, a walk through the a garden of roses. This is a challenge. He says, I want, to, I want to speak to you. So maybe you're there. 
Maybe your Christianity is challenged and it's difficult. Well, this book is a good book for you. It's a good book for all of us that we might know what is, what is godly wisdom, what is godly encouragement that I might be genuinely, a, a genuine Christian walking for Christ in this. And he calls them brethren. Nineteen times in the book of James calls them, these are my brethren. These are those that I, I share that partnership of living for Christ and walking with Christ together in the difficulties that might come. Listen, that's what the church is. We're brethren, sharing together, knowing how to walk through this together, learning it together, walking in it. And so what a great value for us to take the book of James together and to hide it in our hearts and to walk with him. I've got four more pages of notes, which you'll have to come back next week to hear. Um, because I want us to come together as a church family and enjoy some communion around the table together. Uh, and so we're going to stop there this morning. I hope that whets your appetite, gets you started into it, and I hope it'll challenge us as we uh, come to this together uh, and memorize it and hide it in our, in our heart, God's Word, in that walk. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to begin this study together in your Word. And I pray, God, that you would help us to be transformed day by day, more and more, become more like Christ. I'm so thankful for this, this book of James. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we would, we want to be more even like, follow his example, uh, to be recognized we're just bond servants. We're slaves of you, Lord. We're slaves of Jesus Christ. Our identity is in Christ. And Lord, I, I, I find uh, just great encouragement and challenged by that. And may that change us as we walk through our lives. May we find encouragement in this. And God, I pray, um, I pray that you'd challenge this church to memorize this, hide it in their hearts, and you'd help them. And this will be challenging. It's challenging for me uh, to do this. But God, I pray that you would help us to do it and that we would be uh, different and changed as we walk with you through it. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.